don't know. Now, now someone with a cell phone camera filmed them. But, yeah, but they, they did it as he was coming in the, 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 the store. Which So how did they get that kind of prescience? You know, that's I what not be fake. No, it was not fake. <laughs> His mugshot is out there. Okay. I mean, it's, it's probably because uh, he was throwing a temper tantrum beforehand. Mm. So they knew to take out their camera and they, they just got him, you know, uh, macing the employee. All right. So I finished Goldenrod uh, this past week, but. I have a feeling that your insights are going to be a little bit deeper on it, Ben. So I'll let you take the lead here. Yes. And our guest, uh, Bram Riddlebarger, is here. Uh, Bram, can you hear us okay? Yep, I can hear you. Those no echo, hear. right? Can you hear me? Yes, no yep. echo, right? What's that? No echo? No, we don't hear an echo. I don't hear any, no. Okay. Okay. And you're coming in loud and clear. Um, yep. <clears throat> so this is uh, Bram Riddlebarger, author of. Uh, Goldenrod and recently messages from the American trash can. Um, it's good to speak with you, uh, Bran. Um, tell us, uh, um, so for the, so just for the benefit of the audience, um, can you tell us a little bit about Goldenrod? Can I pitch it for people who aren't aware of it? Um, it's a man with a certain predicament uh, that pretty much goes insane and decides to, like many people, uh, somewhat go back to nature, but he's joins a bunch of other equally deranged people, and uh, hmm, they have some adventures in the woods and try to live off the land and fail. <laughs> and it doesn't end well. Hmm. Yeah, that's actually a good summary, but it's um, a lot more exciting than it sounds. Um, because there's a lot of um, a lot of like very interesting and funny moments. Like um, I don't know if it's a spoiler to say this, but Goldenrod refers to the fact that the main character has a severely jaundiced penis. <laughs> he is an alcoholic, isn't he? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. He's a teaaholic. Teaaholic. Okay. He drinks a lot of tea. Yeah, yeah, that's right. See, I, I, I would pick this book up and then I would set it aside and then pick it up again later. So I, I kind of was inconsistent in reading it, but I happened to finish it up. Uh, the characters were interesting. You know, they, they, they were a unique bunch. Uh, I mean, I could I could go into detail about it, uh, but maybe it would be probably be better if you, you or Ben did. So for those who haven't read it, you know, who may want to. The wood yeah, sprites, well, for instance. I mean, what's that? The wood sprites, for instance, right? Oh yeah, the fairies. Yeah, I don't know where I came up with that one. Uh, they were kind of a later thought process in the group. Uh, I just needed like a, you know, the Greek chorus. They were kind of the Greek chorus. A lot of that book uh, yeah. has a lot of like Plato's. Theory allegory of the cave, the cave. and yeah. I needed some of that kind of thing. The Greek chorus needed to be there somewhere, I guess. Yeah, there's, there, a, lot um, there's a lot of that in the book. <laughs> yeah, and like um, Merle Haggard is in the book, but he's always off to the side, like playing the soundtrack to the uh, to the book. Right. He's, he's sort of just a uh, omniscient, <laughs> om omnipresent voice or something occasionally. Like uh, Sam Elliott in The Big Lebowski. Kind of. yeah. That's how it kind of yeah. reminded me of. Uh, I am I wrong? Am I misremember? Am I remembering this wrong? But there's uh, the dog character Sid, right? But there's also the ghost of Sid, and and are, yeah. are and they appear at different times, both of them, right? Well, uh, no, the ghost of Sid disappears every time the real Sid's around. No, but what is that? Is that then, because the afterlife is non-linear time, or what? I never understood that. I think it's that Jack is an unreliable, you know, an unreliable. He's not the narrator, but he's okay. sort of an unreliable character because you don't know whether what he's doing is real or not. Uh -huh. And the end, uh, this spoiler time, I guess, like some of it at the end, like isn't real, although some of it is. So uh, it's sort of like a, a, you know, imaginary world. <laughs> <laughs> Things yeah, don't could, necessarily have to be linear, I guess. Although yeah, they are I, living in a linear time, and you know, but the characters are not necessarily reliable. 
yeah, I just kind of took for granted that uh, everything was happening within the uh, the universe of the uh, of the book. Um, I do, uh, but you know, it makes sense uh, considering you know the character's not really stable, and neither are the, any of the people he meets. <laughs> right. He also meets the revolutionary, who's sort of like the one of the main characters, and uh, and when Jack goes to the asylum, Sid, the real Sid, runs away and joins the revolutionary and so he kind of becomes his dog because he likes it better because he lived a miserable life with the main character jack and, so is this uh, your first so novel when, jack, when jack what's that oh sorry go on yeah so when jack gets out and finds the revolutionary he still still sort of believes that he has the dog and he doesn't really understand that the real sid is now the revolutionary is not his so like that's a, also part of like where the they don't necessarily appear together because the real one is there. Well, I guess that's kind of confusing, but it makes more sense if you read it in the book. <laughs> and so this your first novel. You also do music, right? What's that? You also do music in addition to uh, writing, correct? Yeah. I've played music for a long time. <laughs> do you consider that more of your thing or do you consider writing more of your thing? Oh, uh, certainly music for a very long time. Um, so I, I've been writing, I guess, longer than for sure, longer than I've been playing music. Um, but yeah, I focused on music throughout my twenties and uh, into my thirties, and I still kept writing. I would make chat books all the time, or here not all the time, here and there. Usually, I would make them for like a Christmas gift. I'd just collect stuff that I'd written and have a free thing I could staple together for my family. It didn't cost me too much money um i don't know if they cared to read them but they've always been kind of entertaining um but yeah uh i guess my first novel earplugs is when i really started uh putting some effort into focusing more on the writing though i still kept playing music earplugs what is that <laughs> that was my first attempt at a novel I, I looked up the synopsis for it earlier and, and not not to be I don't know, man, it didn't grab me in the same way that the synopsis for Goldenrod did. It, it, like I, it seems yeah. fairly standard. I don't know. I yeah. now it could it could be a masterpiece for all I know, but <laughs> I don't know. It didn't grab me. The description didn't grab me the way Goldenrods did, you know. Yeah. I think the press wrote that. I don't remember what it says, but it sounds kind of I never particularly like that description myself, to be honest with you. But it, it's kind of a weird book, too. Uh, it sort of follows a small town. That one's more like really small towns sort of based on, I don't know, mainly the town I grew up in and also other towns around here. Wait, uh, Jeremy, what's wrong with that description? Ohio. That description's cool. It, it just seems uh, mediocre compared to what we get in... Goldenrod with the silent Ethiopian, the wood fairies, uh, let's see, the, the revolutionary, a hippie girl, uh, a dog and the ghost of the dog. I mean, compare Wait. all that. Okay, this says, in this novel, a quest for earplugs tries its best to defy old age, young of and a uh, young love and the burden of change. Well, you're what not more could you possibly want? Yeah, <laughs> because of all the things that Goldenrod has in it that hit upon a certain hook with a potential buyer more than quest for earplugs does for instance dog ghost of dog wood fairies uh silent ethiopian revolutionary i mean it's like there's a lot of stuff that can that can get caught up in your entangled in your imagination with a synopsis like that as compared to a quest for just earplugs does. Nah, I disagree. I like a quest for you. I don't give a shit if you disagree. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd be happy to tell you that he finds them at the, at the end of the first chapter. Spoilers. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> but, but yeah, um, so what it's was like it? The uh, of, a, of a guy wearing earplugs all the time because his small town is too loud. Oh, okay. that, that should be the real uh, description. Okay. I thought this uh, was by a nihilism revised. Uh, but it says no, Cabal books. Yeah, Cabal books published it. Okay. The same ones who put out the story of the why. But um, yeah, with with the I guess to go back to earplugs for a moment. Um, 
was that like the first novel you've written or have you like written other ones that you weren't happy with? Oh, no, it was the first one. I've only uh, written two and those are them. Ah, okay. So novels go. Uh, I don't really, it, t it took me a very long time to do both of those. A little bit faster on Goldenrod because I figured out a lot of things, at least for myself, not necessarily work that either work or work for other people, but, but earplugs is a good, uh, it taught me a lot about not only how to go about, uh, making what I would call a novel my, that I wanted to make, uh, but also, you know, what to do with it. So <laughs> I like the earplugs book a lot, but it is much more, uh, an early, you know, attempt. I think Goldenrod is more developed, but I, I spent, uh, dedicated to, like I said, a lot more time and know how to it for what it okay. was worth. What the um, what was it that what was like the starting point for Goldenrod? Did you start with the uh, idea of man with golden penis or did you start from some other like, Yeah. Yeah, it that? came from a story that I wrote with the same title a long time ago. And I sort of just kept developing it. I did that oh. with your plugs a bit too. Sort of like based them off of a previous you know, short story and just develop them and then also, you know, added more storylines and whatnot to attempt to make them a little bit more interesting. Uh, yeah, the the vibe I get from, from the vibe I got from reading it, um, and I, a lot of people seem to agree, is that it uh, seems very, very heavily inspired by uh, Richard Pratt again. Uh, was he uh, a big inspiration? Certainly, yes. He's my favorite writer. Yeah, he's pretty great. Um, so, uh, and how did you, just, he like turned me on to like really, I don't know, I guess I've, I've been a reader my, all, my, all my life, but I started reading him in my teens. Um, uh, my mom had his books like as a sort of ex hippie, you know, they were on the bookshelf along with lots of other things. Hmm. And, uh, I just love, I love poetry probably more than, you know, anything. And yeah. he's just like, good, uh, <laughs> Jeremy doesn't he's, like poetry. He's, he's a poet <laughs> making, you know, he was a poet making books, in my opinion. I, some of these metaphors I've always just enjoyed. Yeah, I like Brodigan's prose, but I, I despise poetry inherently. Like, I feel like it's, <laughs> it's, I feel like it uh, ruins the potential of good stories uh, it when, it, when it is transferred to the poetry medium instead of the fiction medium. Uh, because I feel like the fictional medium is where stories go to retire, and that's where they should be. They should, that's where they should be. I just feel poetry is too flighty, too flaky, and I've 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 been in, at too many public readings where these little girls, you know, do the sing songy poetry, like "You're always there to hold me when I'm upset." You know, they always do yeah. that. They, there's always three or four girls in a, in a reader reader's crowd that do the sing songy poetry bullshit. Oh, you yeah. that bad try slam like, poetry. It's freaking never should have been invented. There's a lot of bad like, stuff out there. Like they tell me this isn't great. It's so nice to wake up in the morning all alone and not have to tell somebody you love them when you don't love them anymore. That's, that's great. That's beautiful. That's yeah. a love poem. Probably his uh, most famous poem. Yeah, that's great. I love that one. I like his poetry as well, uh, but I like poetry too. It's like more simple and, you know, like his and many other people, but I don't know. They always are trying to tell you something else oftentimes as well. Yeah. Or maybe uh, just telling you like how hard life can be <laughs> or maybe how great it can be. Yeah. Brad again is great. And another one of my favorites who um, kind of had a similar style is uh, Stephen Crane. Oh yeah. I love Crane. Yeah, me too. Red Badge of Courage, I think, is one of the great American books. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great book. But my favorite book from his is his uh, poetry book, Black Writers yeah. and Other Lines. I like that one a lot too. I just reread that actually. I don't know, a couple years ago. Had yeah, I, I, for probably ten or fifteen years. I, I I read one of the poems at my grandpa's funeral. I mean, that's that's how much it you know impacted wow. me. Yeah, he's an amazing writer. Just his writing, his writing in general is just something about it. I just have always liked. Did you, uh, Bram? Did you ever get a 
did you ever get a glance at that un, unpublished uh, work that uh, Browdigan, uh, that, that was talked about with Browdigan for several years called God of the Martians? Hmm, I'm not sure I have. I, I contacted his daughter uh, about it once and I never got a reply back, but uh, I, I feel like, you know, surely she would publish it even if it was in fragments or, or un, unfinished. You know, sometimes they will publish things as they were left right. unfinished, right? Yeah. Like even the trial was unfinished, if right. I recall. Yeah. Well, well, believe it or they not. Actually, they put out, you know, some of his stuff posthumously that was, you know, I thought not necessarily the best quality, but I like reading his stuff no matter what, so I, I read it, but... Uh, yeah, I, I just haven't feel heard like of that. I actually, maybe I've heard of that, but I've I've never read any of it. But God of the yeah. Martians, can you imagine what kind of that story that would be in the hands of someone like Browdigan, whose imagination is so gnome-like and and just enchanting? <laughs> yeah, who knows? What, yeah. Was it like a, a novel or like a? I think it was going to be a novel. I I don't think he finished it, uh, yeah. you know, in time, but. Uh, I think it was going to be published. I read that the the biography, uh, Jubilee Hitchhiker, uh, when it came out. I guess that's been a little while ago. Mm. I wonder if that was mentioned in there. I don't. I don't remember. I actually read his daughter's um, uh, biography on her father, and uh, yeah. she was surprisingly sensitive to him uh, in his accomplishments, um, even though he wasn't always the best. You know, most uh, lucid, affectionate father. She still right. could find the good in him. Then you look over at uh, Dreamcatcher, a memoir by one of Salinger's kids, and and she just runs him down the road, right? <laughs> I thought that book that uh, you can't catch death is that the, the one you're talking about? Yeah, by our yeah. I am. I actually thought that yeah. was the, not only a wonderful homage or whatever to your father but also was really well written like yeah i was really entertained by that book i, I think it was really great but see two got two authors with similar similar like reclusive tendencies both authors of right. uh, i mean and and both both daughters of these men had severely polarized takes you know yeah, yeah. in in salinger's case his daughter, as I recall, runs him down the road, basically. And Bradigan's <laughs> was able to find, you know, some sort, some measure of peace and respect for him, you know? Mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm sure, sure. Uh, Bradigan in his personal, because he ended up committing suicide. So he, he obviously did, <coughs> excuse me, didn't have the best personal life. Um, but he was, you know, definitely a great writer. Um, I've actually heard that they, um, uh, that that the Hawklight monster is being adapted into a movie by the same guy who did um, the lobster and uh, the killing of a sacred deer. Hmm. Is that who was doing it? I heard that they were making the movie. I didn't know it was that guy. Yeah, it's uh, apparently him. I'm I'm afraid of those movies. <laughs> no, I do love I do no. I mean, I'm afraid of them adapting that. But that guy uh, did make really good movies. I the lobster and both those movies are really great. I love that weird stuff. Yeah, it would be cool to see that movie adapted if someone in his yeah. You it know what Browdigan a... book? Do, oh, I'm sorry, Bram. Go ahead. No, no. Well, ahead. you know what Browdigan book doesn't get a lot of love, but I think it's just as imaginative as anything in trout fishing or in watermelon sugar. It's sombrero sombrero fallout. Mm -hmm. anybody anybody read that one? I just reread that. I read I reread a lot of his actually uh, during quarantine. As I remember. <laughs> He he takes a he wads up uh, the, the writer in this book take, wads up some of his work throws it in a trash can and it, like a civilization develops around that wadded up paper or something like a little city is that right yeah. something <laughs> like that it's a strange book and then it's always her hair her black hair is like every scene it's it's very repetitive like that Radigan was the man I mean he, he was but yeah. Uh, anyway yeah so. Back to, back to the yeah. other stuff, I guess. Yeah, back to uh, your books. The reason we're here, um, <laughs> but the, yeah, your newest one uh, does seem like you know to transition. Does seem like the most Browdigan-esque uh, 
I kind of I haven't read it yet, but I flipped through it, and um, the structure seems very similar to trout fishing in America. I did somewhat, yeah. I definitely uh, was trying to utilize more of the sort of metaphysical stuff. I guess I've done that a little bit in all my books, but I was certainly shooting for that with this one just to see how I could how you could do it. I'm not sure it was completely successful, but I'm pretty I, it was fun to do. I I think a lot of it worked out pretty well. And uh I thought the layout turned out really nicely in the end. So Yeah, that's it's, it's got that it's, it's definitely uh an experimental book to some degree. But also, yeah, it definitely draws um, on yeah. trout fishing, for sure. Yeah, it uh, kind of, like, one thing especially was, um, like, uh, uh, Brodigan's Trout Fishing in America, like, he has the cover. And then, like, I think before, like, almost anything else in the book, there's, like, a, sh a brief story about the um, right. about the cover with you. You right. have a, a brief story before the interior art on the title page about that interior art. What's that? About like the, in yeah. Yeah. the interior art. You know, sort of, actually, that that's kind of a weird one, because that, I actually wrote that book to that cover of that statue. Uh, I was playing a show, a music show, uh, down the river, uh, about an hour from here in Galbalis, and or Galbalis, as some, a lot of people say. Um, and there's a statue there. This was like two years ago, and uh, I just thought it was just this interesting moment where you have all the trucks pulling into the go boating in this hot summer day and this you know weird statue like welcoming it's like the white people arriving because they arrived in marietta and that area of the river like kind of first and so it's sort of this frontier statue of like the white people coming ashore with a baby to and Presumably, like, you know, you would have been the Native Americans looking at them like that's why they're asking for help, which certainly was not the way it went. You know, it was a, a war for years. And uh, and then, of course, we have the modern political climate where we're turning people away and not helpful and just sort of goes against uh, this welcoming idea. And uh, a lot of that book is older stories, but like that sort of became the motif, I guess. And so I wrote that book to that statue picture and so i'd written that chapter anyway and actually wasn't sure where to put it and i reread i did uh i had reread trout fishing uh, not even very long ago like i said i i was i had to quit my i had a job and a lot I well i quit it because i didn't want to work in a warehouse during virus time um and so i was bored you know stuck at home with my family for a couple of weeks quarantining and I just needed to read something that was familiar and so I reread some of the brought in the books and uh, trout fishing being one of them and I did notice that like intro and I was like man I could just put it at the beginning like that and it's definitely uh, influenced by that big time because it was going to go more toward the end I wasn't sure how to do it um, so that's why I put it there and then, yeah, it turned out kind of this in the same sort of fashion. Like, but then we, with the with the press, like we, Bix like the trash can picture. I took those after the book was already finished. I was at a cemetery, uh, actually down in Palmoy, also on the river, uh, the Ohio River, and uh, it's all these trash cans with like the rusted <laughs> American trash can. I was just like, that's, that's too weird and. It was a beautiful, I guess, it was a beautiful uh, sort of winter day, uh, later winter. And the pictures turned out nice, and so I guess we kind of flip-flop back and forth, and then the whole statue toppling stuff was going on. And I kind of, I guess I have mixed feelings about that, but I certainly don't think we should be um, honoring people that don't deserve it, I guess. And so I just thought it was... I was also uh, I thought it was kind of a bad idea to have a statue on the cover at that point. Uh, even though the book still has to have the statue, and the statue is written into the book in a few places. And so, yeah, we just put it on the inside. And uh, the trash can I like, so we put it on the front, and Bix liked it right across. And uh, so we kind of switched, because it was going to be the uh, the statue, but 
and then the Michael Kazipi did the layout, and he did a great job because uh, I wanted to put the statue still at the beginning of the book with that story, so you know what sort of is going on, and you also have that welcoming, and so we put it on the inside, and that's how that worked out. Was it originally called Messages from the American Trash Can, or did it have a different title? Uh, it was that. That's actually a chat book. Some of those stories are uh, were in this chat book that I made, sort of what I was talking about earlier, years ago, and I would just make them occasionally. And it was probably, I don't know, 30 stories, some of which are in that book, not very many, but and some other ones are probably cut. Um, uh, over 100 stories from that manuscript <laughs> over the course of narrowing it down to what it became there were a whole bunch of them in there and so i just took i'd always like that title and uh i had actually been working on a, a sequel to that called messages from the american trash can 2 or that was the early name and i had this whole idea it was all going to be illustrated like every story had an illustration and i actually got pretty far into it and then i started realizing i didn't like a lot of the stories it was kind of like too much filler because i'd also gone back through a lot of my shorter fiction stuff and kind of was accumulating things that I liked and I realized I didn't like a whole bunch of them and so I just started cutting and cutting and finally I just sort of was like well I just turn it back into messages from the American trash can the, the trash I had accumulated more trash over time and I knew I could make more sections <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's uh, so yeah that's uh, that, uh, that uh, does seem like to be an important part of it is uh, just you know going through and finding everything you've written that isn't um, that you don't consider trash. Uh, I have the kind of the same problem with uh, you know the way to its guide to saying goodbye. Like uh, you know going through a bunch of stories I originally wanted to include, and I was like, oh wait, I can't include this because it's shit, <laughs> right. um, or it just doesn't fit. You know, like I mean, there were some that I still might like, but they just you know they got to fit too. And I was trying to keep that one pretty lean. Yeah. So I. I kept cutting and cutting and cutting even when I didn't want to. And then I yeah. sort of made sure to limit myself by, oh geez, I actually forget. I think there's like eight or nine in between each piece of trash story. How do you let go of things that you don't want to cut? That, that's something I don't, uh, I yeah, can't get. <laughs> yeah, who was it that said, uh, who was it that said, kill your babies? Right. Kill your darlings. Oh, your darlings. That's what it was. Your babies. Okay. I think that's very important. That's the hard thing to do. But it yeah. always makes it better. Almost the always, in my opinion. It, it almost yeah, it always does. makes it more lean. Yeah. I know people who like will keep things that they've been working on since they were teenagers and keep piddling with it. And I, I've never had that mentality. I always just like cut things and like start new. I, I really don't get why some people like keep trying to like resuscitate really dead projects. Right. Hey, I mean, check it, it out. Uh, keep stuff, but, you Phoenix know. <laughs> in the chat bought uh, Poem 3 AM. Oh, sweet. Thank you. All right. Yeah, that's, Watermelon that's Sugar. Right. That's a good one. Yeah, that's definitely a great book. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of forgot about the Poem 3 AM uh, that you did with uh, Nihilism Revised. Yeah, that's that cool was actually cover. one of those like, weird... Uh, that wasn't really a chat book, but it was. I made it. It was in slightly different form, but that's an it was an older one. Um, that I always liked because it was sort of like a interesting story. Definitely be influenced, <laughs> but it was a uh, experimental, experimental weird cantos or whatever. <laughs> yeah, so nihilism revised definitely uh, seemed like a good place for that. Um, I yeah. was going to ask, how did you? Uh, how, yeah, how did you uh, come across uh, uh, Cabal books? Or because I know that for. You were the first that you were actually the first cabal book um yeah how did you come in contact with uh bix to get that released oh uh, well i guess after earplugs like i said i learned a lot about uh well editing that book <laughs> took a lot of editing and and rejection and uh i finally found a home with that uh with uh livingston press joe taylor is a really good guy the editor uh, of that and uh, so I guess I learned a whole bunch about trying to find things and I was also I don't know I was always I guess I was more focused on music for so long I didn't pay that much attention even to like 
how to deal with publishing, even in the small time world, but um, or the small press world. I guess it's the same thing, maybe. Um, so I, was, I don't know, social media. You know, I just uh, I was always looking for things that were interesting and people that I thought would be receptive and also that would were doing things similar or I thought maybe similar to what I like to do. Um, which is obviously, I don't know if that's very difficult all the time, trying to wade through the waters of social media, at least for me, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of stumbled across them by <laughs> uh, thick and veiny by accident. And, yeah. You know, that's why I said it's the story of the why. Yeah. I like that book a lot. Yeah, thanks. Um, I really appreciate the, I think, yeah, I think you gave me a blurb for it, and I do appreciate that. Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, I think I saw Bix like at a festival or something, and I, his name came up, and I looked up his press, and we just sort of connected, and I sent him. Uh, I guess Goldenrod was pretty well formed at that point, so it was probably the, that text pretty much. It went through a little bit of editing for sure. Have you ever thought about doing like a hybrid thing with music and writing? Oh, I don't know. I kind of think of them as two as this pendulum that I often swing back and forth on. <laughs> I'm often on one side or the other. I don't know. Also, and doing both at the same time. I don't know. Yeah, like I don't know. Like maybe I have, I've written the lyrics for my band, so I guess I just see it as another form of writing. You know. Yeah, I guess lyrics go. I mean, I, I guess like one possible thing is like putting together like a soundtrack for your book or something. Like obviously, like Golden Rock, you, you explicitly state in the book, uh, "No Merle Haggard" as a soundtrack, but right. you know, or something yeah. like uh, having someone like read, you know, your poetry or, or some of your prose or something like that, you know, over some of your music. That's a good idea. I haven't really ever thought about it to be honest with you. I guess I thought about uh, slightly differently, but I, yeah, you don't usually think of them like maybe one's a ref refuge from the other or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I think about like combining like uh, music and and writing, I think about the collaboration that uh, Ben Folds and Nick Hornsby did. Oh yeah, I don't know that. <laughs> the one of the they have a funny song called "Working Day." Uh, one of the lyrics of that song is, "Some guy on the net thinks I suck, and he should know he has his own blog." <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is a great song. It's it's like yeah. about anyone who's in that creative field, the kind of you know, doubts they feel, like imposter syndrome and things like that. <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to think about it. Do you ever have problems with that, like imposter syndrome and feeling like, you know, what you do is, what, everything you do is shit? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't met anyone who does, like, creative work that uh, doesn't feel like that, with the exception of a couple people who are just complete narcissistic douchebags. <laughs> I mean, my hundreds of thousands of sales every week tell me differently, but I just can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just like, like, oh, Christ, how are they all going to react when they realize I'm a fraud? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that it matters very much, you know? It's not like, uh... yeah, you know, I mean, how many, people, how many people are out there listening? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nobody listens to us. You can see. <laughs> They listen later. For some reason, but yeah. uh, Bram, I, I actually, uh, if you don't mind going into it, uh, I hope this isn't too sensitive. But uh, the picture at the end of Goldenrod uh, with the dog, the graves, right? That's pretty girl. Like that book's dedicated to her. She was my best dog. She just died this past winter. Oh, poor thing. Yep. How old was she? Oh, uh, it's 14 or so. We had to put her down. She Her hips gave out. So oh, That's never easy. She was a great dog. Well, who, if you don't mind me asking, were, were those, is that family uh, that pretty girl is laying by? Nope, that is actually the grave of uh, Don Robertson. Who, now, who is that? Epilogue is, is, is his from his uh, book Paradise Falls. And he is buried in my hometown, uh, High Elms Cemetery, that you can see where I, my childhood home is, like, right down the hill. And it's kind of weird. He was, a. Uh, I didn't actually even know that until, well, he didn't die until I was, pretty much had left home. But uh, 
he sort of claimed uh, Logan, Ohio is is like a second sort of, I don't know, maybe home or something. Though he lived in Cleveland, I'm pretty sure most of his life. Mm. He uh, was really interested in this area, and he was down here a lot. And he wrote a lot of books about southeastern Ohio, sort of about uh, sort of like meshes of book, you know, like drawing on different towns and making them into blood is one of the towns. Uh, it's all about coal mi- uh, at least Paradise Falls is all about coal mining and um, the towns around here and just how this area was completely, you know, denuded and destroyed uh, during the you know late 1800s after the Civil War, during the Civil War mined out and timbered out which my books yeah. kind of go into some of this too like that's how the why there's so much uh state land and forest land around here now is like after it was all destroyed state bought a lot of it up like during the uh, like depression type stuff and to like help bring it back and restore the area to some degree but they also got all the land for basically free <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah and that's... still pretty bad a lot <laughs> i mean this is a very poor area uh yeah, there's definitely that uh, that sense in Goldenrod uh, this, right. this, that it's a sort of um, you know uh, kind of dying small town and like it's surrounded right. by forest and you know like um, at one point the guy just uh, if I remember right uh, Jack the the guy with the golden penis just kind of abandons his truck and it feels like a completely natural thing to do. Right. Yeah, he burns it. Well, yeah. Oh yeah, he burned it. Yeah, he did. Yeah, that's like the opening scene or. It wasn't the opening scene. I moved it to the opening scene, but yeah, I mean, this area is certainly better off now. But uh, Paradise Falls had a big influence on me. I, I'm always interested in books from there aren't necessarily that many from southeastern Ohio writers from here that you know publish books. But if I find them, I usually read them, or you know, it's it's always interesting. His book, Paradise Falls, I just love. It's this gigantic book. It's like, I have it in two volumes, and they're each like a thousand pages. Oh, wow. It's kind of falling apart. Like, you can't find that book, I don't think, very much. So I had this, like, old edition, and the, it still has the covers on it, but they're falling off. But I just love that book, and I I thought I used... I didn't use it, but it was in my mind for sure when I wrote Golden Rod, as far as, uh, just like you said, like that sort of giving it a sense of doom including the ending and like the destruction of nature to some degree is in there. And I also like how uh, bookends, you know, they're like two bookends, like the, the epigraph and the dedication are together for the author picture. So I went up there to the cemetery and uh, took that picture uh, leading up to the publication of that just to sort of honor uh, both the writer and my dog. Because she was sort of the inspiration for Sid, actually, as far as like a faithful companion, you know. Yeah. Um, but we knew she was gonna, she was on her way out. She was kind of losing it for a while, so I thought that was nice. Plus, I don't like author pictures very much. I'd rather use like a some other picture. Yeah. I used I used the trash can again on on this last one. Yeah. Which I like <laughs> Uh, they're both in cemeteries, and like so, I've got the cemetery in there on like all fronts, which I like because I've always been really drawn to cemeteries. <laughs> Home three AM, as a matter of fact, has the cemetery in it quite a bit. Yeah, I guess that's one thing you. Um, as I point you from Brad again, you don't like putting your pictures in the books. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, he would true. he would plaster he would plaster his mug on the covers. <laughs> right, all right, yeah, that's true. I love those covers. <laughs> Yeah, they're very. I, I actually like covers like that that are very like simplistic, uh, mysterious. That's just right. like especially like a, especially works for messages from the American trash can. It's just a picture of this star spangled trash can. Right. <laughs> and the, but, uh, there's the tombstone in the back. Yeah, but the you know and goldenrod uh, that has a pretty cool cover. You know Matthew Everett, he always does great work. Um, yeah. it, it, it definitely captures like the feel of the. Of the book, the sort of like a uh, dirty kind of backwards feel. On Goldenrod. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. We had to kind of the first cover he sent. Uh, he does great work all the time. So like, even when he sends you one we didn't use, it's still just a beautiful cover. His work is definitely amazing. He sent yeah. us one that <laughs> it's kind of funny that about that. 
that was uh it worked really well maybe it was even that picture but it was like the steering wheel was on the wrong side for americans you know he's australian oh (laughs) probably never thought about it but he like this was a great cover um or may, like I said, maybe it was that one in a slightly different form, and he we may have just reversed it, but it was like the steering wheel was on the wrong side, and it looked great, but I was just like, it can't be like a foreign car. It has to be like this book is about southeastern Ohio, and I'm just yeah. particular about stuff like that. I was like, we gotta like make it at least like that. I don't think is an American car, but at least the steering wheel is on the right side. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, it looks like it could be like a dilapidated, abandoned American car. Or something right, like you that. never know. Yeah, I don't know where he got that, but maybe that's why he had to smear it all that uh, and all <laughs> that uh, rot on it. It's <laughs> possible. I don't know. He's great, though. I love his stuff. Yeah, definitely. I thought that kind of turned out really nice. Yeah, yeah I probably like what he did for the story of the lie too. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward. Sweet. Yeah, I'm looking forward to see what he does for the uh, future Cabal books. Hey, um, it's, it's the cover. Yeah, <laughs> just a Star Spangled Trash Can. <laughs> yeah, Meg's killing me. That's your latest one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that just came out uh, this 4th of July. Yep. I have another oh. one coming up. It's suddenly, yeah. like, a uh, comment. It's weird having two in one month. Yeah, that just one's... That one's called West 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 Erotica Ho or something like that. Western Erotica Ho. Oh, yeah. uh, but that's a book of poetry. Yeah. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're just we, oh, they're just stories and poetry. <laughs> Je- Jeremy be like, "Fuck poetry! All my homies hate poetry." <laughs> it is a story though. It's like a travel log. Oh, okay. Of, like a- I, I know one author that can pull that off. Um, Matthew something or other. I don't remember his last name, but uh, he he writes all these fantastical urban legends in like a, a fiction poetry hybrid, and he does it really well. But uh, other than that, I don't know. But um, you what, know, like in a Dr. Seussian kind of way. No, what is his name? Matthew Bialer. 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 Mm-hmm. I know you're talking about. B I A L E R. Oh, he he Wonder, Wonder, Wonder Wheel. Wheel. I think he wrote Wonder Wheel and uh, yeah, something about alien abduction, maybe a few other things. But he uh, he calls it epic poetry, I think. And uh, they he's all right, and Philip Lopresti's all right. But man, damn, I just I I guess being in a ro- local writers group and hearing all the sing songy, you know. Uh, Fre- college freshman girls uh, reading their love poetry it just it did me in on that this stuff. But, I mean, but Jeremy, this it's one's called turn you around. <laughs> <laughs> this one's Jer- change you, change you. Yeah, forever. it's called Western Erotica, uh, Western Erotica. Ho, so obviously you can masturbate to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I don't uh, do that anymore. Yeah. I'm really happy about that book. Of that course book, you don't. That book has had a strange voyage. I wrote that, uh, literally wrote it on vacation in this little tiny notebook that I just sort of died, you know, it was my, my, literally my travel log. And, uh, of course I, you know, finished it later and as far as like working on it, but, uh, that one has had a strange history. It's like been under contract before once or I guess once. And then I had also talked to, uh, now that I'm revised about putting that one out at one point and, I don't know. It's I always just had this bad luck. It was literally going to be published and had a cover once, and then it fell through because the uh, press decided not to be a press, you know, and like so they just dropped everything, and <laughs> and so I was kind of too bad because I actually really I like that one. I've written a lot of weird little poetry books, but that one I'm I've always been kind of proud of, just because I think it tells an interesting, just sort of snapshot story, you know. Of like a bit weird little vacation trip. It's kind of nice, in my opinion. And the cover yeah. turned out really great with that one. Uh, that was yeah. with Trident Press, and it was really nice working with them on that. Over yeah. the last year, I guess it's been about almost a year or something, but we kind of worked yeah. on it over the winter, and it just kind of turned out that it was going to come out uh, the same month uh, at the same time. It's kind of weird. 
but I think it's a good time because that's a summer book. You know, it's like a vacation book. And, uh, yeah, so I'm happy that's coming out. Yeah, what's a, that's a pretty eye-catching title. Um, well, how did you come up with that? I have no idea. I, I, I came up with it on that trip. It was just like that was like the story of our journey, and that was just it. I probably wrote it in the notebook that I was carrying with me. It just seemed like the appropriate title. I don't know why. I, I remember I shared it. it, and, it works. <laughs> yeah, I remember I shared it, and someone in the comments said, I guess uh, Western Hose was already taken. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I was, uh, I've was i been really busy lately, but I had a little bit of time today to get on the computer and um, do some like upgrading of you know of the bio and stuff on the, some sites just because of these books coming out and so i tried to look uh i've you tried to press the selling map through their website so i usually just use their website but i'd seen that amazon had it and so i tried to look up the number of a book on amazon so i just clicked in you know books search that title and it didn't have my book at all but it had as you can imagine like all these lovely <laughs> romances that had a rock in the title. There was like this like giant list and I scrolled down for a while and was like, my book isn't even in here. And I, it's on there. I found it, but you can't search in the engine, I guess, and find it without <laughs> no. finding busty vixens with cowboy hats or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Strange. You just get a bunch of, uh, yeah, a bunch of, uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, one of those cheesy self-published books with uh, yes. I don't know, women with big tits and on cowboy <laughs> hats on. It was something like that. I don't know. I couldn't find it though. I had to go back and look at it a different, a different way. Yeah. Don't let an entire tradition of thousands of years be represented <laughs> by whiny sentimental girls. Yeah, and uh, don't, don't let um, <laughs> and don't let Jeremy with his all my homies hate poetry shit ruin it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I obviously came up with that because of Westward Ho, but I, I don't know why I came up with the, I guess it was just uh, the family conf. I don't know. It makes more sense if you if you buy the book and read it. Yeah. Kind of so. a, I think it's a good title for that. Yeah, I'll definitely. Yeah, I'll definitely be picking that up as, as well. Um, the so, um, really nice on that as well, I think. Yeah. So um, to backtrack a little to... Um, uh, um, messages from the American trash can. Uh, you said that that, and um, as well as like Poem 3 AM, uh, uh, started off as chat books. What's that? <laughs> you said that those, that uh, Poem 3 AM and uh, messages from the American trash can started off as chat books. Yeah. I've, I've written, I don't know. Or I guess I, I always like to say I've stapled together, uh, I don't know, probably. 12 or more chat books. So I love making those things. They're, they're, they're like my, the thing that I find most rewarding in writing is, I mean, cause I write anyway. Uh, I'm always just, you know, jotting stuff down or, you know, the novels I was very good about dedicating time and working on. And I do that with projects once they get going. I'm, you know, I'm pretty good about buckling down and getting really focused on them. Um, I have another book like that that I, I'm sort of, I have another collection of stories that I need to do that on. But once I get on it, it'll take me a year or two, probably before I'm happy with editing. Hmm. So, so that's once true. I get on it, I always like know I'm going to dedicate a lot of time to it. So sometimes I procrastinate, so I don't have to do that if I'm busy with other things. Um, but yeah, those were chat books. There's a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, I, know, I just draw on them if I need to, or sometimes they're self contained units like um, Poem 3M or Western Erotic Ho. They, um, those books have changed a little bit from their chat book days for sure, but like the, the uh, even messages from the American Trash Can, though that one's changed just a, a whole lot. It's like the, the, I guess the bones of it are still based on the chat book as far as that goes i don't know it helps me uh focus on like what i like you, know, you can usually see how much you don't like stuff once it's on in print 
and it also makes you edit, you know, so editing is always great. You're going to yeah. edit it if you're going to staple it together and spend, you know, $50 at FedEx or Kinko's or whatever it is, you know, to, to, to print it off. But, yeah. you know, I have the nice stapler, you know, I have a big checkbook stapler. I love those things. So, I just like making stuff. <laughs> you know, it's like fun to make it. It's a hands-on experience. And a, <laughs> and a mental one as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's, that can be um, very gratifying, putting a, a chapbook together. Are you still making them? Yeah, I just made a couple a uh, few months ago. I hadn't made any for a while, but I guess I collect so much stuff, I'll just end up like weeding through my editing stuff and finding stuff that goes together and uh, staple it up. <laughs> I don't know. It's fun. I like it. Yeah, do you ever just like have... Uh, I usually only make like 10 or 15 of you know, copies of each one and most of them sit on my shelf and then I'll give them to I guess a, it's a good Christmas gift to my siblings or something that put it on their shelf and they may not read it but <laughs> or my mom you know I'll send one to my mom it's fun yeah, and you said you're what you're working on now is a, a book of short stories yeah uh, it's like fleshed out but needs edited heavily some of the stories are not done um, and I, there I don't a, know. There'll probably be a couple more that I add in over the course of uh, finishing it. I'm trying to get to like I don't know. I don't want it to be very long, and I don't know what I'll do with it. But uh, I'm trying to get it to be short, but you know, maybe like 160 pages or something, maybe. And so I'm almost there. I think I got about 140, and <laughs> oh, I, have wow. more, 100, I have a couple more stories that like. I have the idea written down that I haven't written for it. And uh, I still need to heavily edit a whole bunch of them. <laughs> That's for sure. But yeah, it's like, it's flushed out. Uh, do you have, do you have a, um, any idea where that's coming out to? Or are you planning on oh, sending that to um, Cabal? Or, or do you have anything else, in, anywhere else in mind? I don't have any, I got to finish it. I don't know. I guess we'll can't think about that until it's finished. Yeah, I think I'm that's probably I'm not gonna do it. Yeah, I got, I got to finish it. I have a few other uh, manuscripts in the works, but they're sort of projects, you know, that are going to happen over time. One of them okay. is just exclusively uh, talking animals. I always like animals that talk. I like children's mm -hmm. books a lot, so I, I think that's why I like talking animals. Yeah, that was kind of uh, both yours and kind of the um, you know kind of vibe you get from their book uh, from Brad again and your book. So almost like it's a kids' book written for adults. I like that. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think uh, children's literature and children's books are greatly underappreciated as far as literature. You know, there's so much good, uh, um, so many great writers: Ralph Dahl, Seuss, obviously. Um, Shel Silverstein. Yeah, I don't know. There's just uh, so many great children's writers. Like I, I couldn't. I don't even remember the names of half of them. But you just think of all the stuff you read as a kid that had a huge influence on you. Yeah. Some of it's still great if you read it now. <laughs> yeah, definitely, Jeremy. Have you read Shel Silverstein? Jeremy. Zach. Yeah. yeah uh, oh, Mike, <laughs> we're alone. A light in the attic. Yeah, I did. That's good. Yeah, it is. Shel Silverstein is good poetry. Uh, <laughs> I just don't like poetry, though. Wrong, <laughs> wrong answer. Get out of here. I really don't. <laughs> okay. Um. So yeah, I think that the about covers pretty much everything. Uh, Bram, is there anything else you want to say, or anything else you want to plug before we let you go? Well, I can't think of anything. Okay, so Good uh, you guys. yeah, so messages from the American Trash Can is available on Amazon or wherever books are sold. Available from Cabal Books. One more uh, thing. Oh, go ahead. One more thing, and like I said, I would pick up Goldenrod and then put it down again. So I was kind of in and out, you know, inconsistently, you know, before I finished it this past week. Can you explain? A little more about what a loco locavore is without giving anything away 
like major? Uh, well, it's technically someone that like tries to just eat local food, but uh, I sort of that makes sense. Trends, you know, there's two kinds of locavores in my book. Uh, there's the locavores. I mean, the, that's what the you know well, they're doing it because they're living in a cave trying to survive. You know, by making it on their own and eating mm -hmm. from the land, which you know is like a big hippie motif and people around here are still very much like that. There's a lot of that, you know, I grew up with that and it usually doesn't end very well because, you know, right. but, and it doesn't in that book. And so I sort of, you know, I guess I can't give everything away, but there's like the, you know, like going back to children's books, there's a monster at the end of this book. Yes. Is, uh, Groper says that, I think. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, <laughs> Because when you hear local lore, the first thing I, I think of is crazy eater. <laughs> right. <laughs> local lore. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so... Um, local local vor vorism. Yeah, so uh, beware the local lore, kids. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, Messages from the American Trash Can is out now from Cabal Books, available on Amazon. You said that Western Erotica Ho is, is also out? Uh, it's up for pre-order. It comes out the 28th, I believe. Okay, and that's up for pre-order, and uh, you can find, uh, just uh, go to anywhere where you buy books, so that's uh, Amazon or any other, or like bookshop.org, uh, just search Bram Riddlebarger's name, you can probably find all of his books there. Um, Bram, it's uh, been a pleasure having you on. Thank you for having me. It's good talking to you. We'll talk to you later. All right, see you. All right, so <clears throat> we ready for uh, the new cameo? Yeah, sure. Uh, let's see it. This better be good. <laughs> oh, you mean I waited till he was gone? <laughs> it is. It is good. It, it, it. She actually gives uh, a lot of encouragement to you guys. Well, uh, Zach said he was getting getting another drink. I'm gonna grab one really quick. So yes. fill the dead air, but until I get back. Yes. By the way, did I mention? <laughs> Oh, I can hear my. I can fucking hear my. Hear my. Why did you Why do did this? You, do to me? you did this on purpose. <laughs> I'm echoing back. Okay, that now. Now I'm better. Okay. That wasn't me. I, I pulled my headphones out, but it's it's never done that before. 